Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in this session we are going to talk further on carbohydrates. We have carried sessions for you on carbohydrates and today also we will try to give you more and more of information. We are basically going to talk on structures of monosaccharides as well as on absolute configuration of monosaccharides. And for the discussion, we have with us in our studios Dr. Prajita Chauhan. Dr. Prajita Chauhan is Associate Professor in Department of Chemistry, Sri Aurobindo College, University of Delhi. Friends, if you have any question regarding carbohydrates and specifically regarding today's topic, then do call us through our toll-free number. Our number is 18001010430. I repeat, our number is 18001010430. Now, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Prajita Chauhan, and would request her to give us in depth knowledge about monosaccharides. Hello, ma'am. Welcome Thank to the you. lecture. Thank you, Gitika. Uh, hello, viewers. In my last lecture, we had talked about classification of monosaccharides and the DL nomenclature of monosaccharides. So what we saw there is that the, when we classify monosaccharides, we normally do them or we call them by their common names. And that is we call glucose, mannose, fructose, lactose and so on. So classification of monosaccharides is simplified by grouping them, the similar structures together. And there are three criteria for classification of monosaccharides. That is, they can be classified on the basis of the carbonyl functional group, number of carbon atoms in the carbon chain, and stereochemical configuration of the asymmetric carbon, which is furthest from the carbonyl group. So what I mean here is, that is, when we talk of a carbonyl group, whether the sugar has an aldehyde group or a ketonic group, if a sugar has an aldehyde group, we call them as aldoses, and if they have a ketonic group, we call them as ketoses. And the second thing that we have to keep in mind is that the number of carbon atoms generally range between 3 to 6 in monosaccharides. So that means we can now classify monosaccharides as aldohexoses or ketoses. So now if an we have a aldehyde functional group and along with that we have six carbons as I can see in this structure. Then I would call this molecule as an aldohexose. We will take the specific names on the basis of structures quite after this. And then if I, we have a CO that is a ketonic functional group then it is known as a ketohexose. Similarly, if a monosaccharide has four carbons in, in the carbon chain. We call it as a tetrose and if it has an aldehyde group, it becomes an aldotetrose. Similarly, we can have a ketotetrose in which the functional group is a carbonyl group and then the number of carbon atoms again here is 4. So, on the basis of the number of carbon atoms and on the basis of the functional group, we can put the monosaccharides as aldohexose family or as an aldo family or as a ketose family. Now, we have also discussed in my previous lecture that most of the naturally occurring sugars have D configuration. So, what we mean by saying D configuration here is that the highest numbered asymmetric carbon has OH on the right hand side with when it is compared to glycerol dehyde which is taken as an arbitrary standard. So now we know that most of the members of the D family which occur in are found in nature except for thriose, thriose is a tetrose and liox which is a pentose, allose and gulose which are hexoses. So, all these four aldohexoses are not found in nature, otherwise all the other members of D family are found in nature. So, another thing that you have to keep in mind is that the, when we talk of a capital D or capital L, we are referring to configuration that is the position of the OH on the highest numbered asymmetric carbon whether it is on the right hand side or on the left hand side when compared to glyceraldehyde. 
it does not tell us the way the sugar will rotate the plane of polarized light. So what you have to remember is capital D and capital L is referring to the configuration. Now when we talk of L doses, so we know that if a molecule has one chiral carbon, it will exist as two stereoisomers that is if I talk of glyceraldehyde, then glyceraldehyde will occur as D glyceraldehyde and L glyceraldehyde and this pair you know is non superimposable on the each other hence they we call them enantiomers. But now as I have already said that most of the carbohydrates occur in nature in D configuration. So now what we are going to do is we are going to concentrate on D configuration also or on the D family in other words. Now if we have to memorize this that is the question is asked that draw the family tree of D L doses it is going to be a difficult task that means you have to memorize it no let us find a solution to it. So that means now we will only be concentrating on D isomers. So glyceraldehyde has two out of which we are taking the D configuration and now if I talk of D glyceraldehyde and I lengthen the change that is glyceraldehyde has three carbons in it I will just show you the structure that is this glyceraldehyde has three carbons in it. So now when I lengthen the structure that means we will be adding another carbon at this point we will be creating a bridge at this point and when we do this what we find is that this from this glyceraldehyde we can have two tetroses right and if now each tetros and now if I lengthen the ring the size of erythros then what we find is again we can have a bridge and then from that we can again have two isomers ribose and arabinose and if we talk of threos then threos will again give me two stereoisomers which are xylose and liox. <coughs> now what we find is ribose will give rise to two again arabinose again two stereoisomers xylose again two isomers Lyox again two isomers now we will see how are these isomers being formed and we have to re even remember the structure of all these L doses. So now first of all let me tell you how will you remember the name of these compounds. So please remember if I take this as a pyramid I consider this as a pyramid. So if you have to remember the name of the top of the pyramid that is name of triose tetraose and pentoses. What you have to remember is you have to remember the sentence get rexil. Now what does get rexil mean? You have to remember G in get rexil stands for glyceraldehyde, E for erythrose, T for threose, R for ribose, A for arabinose, X for xylose and L for liox. So that means you just have to remember get rexel and you would know what is your series. Now if we come on to hexoses, we have 8 hexoses whose name we have to memorize. So this you can memorize by remembering the sentence all alterist gladly make gum in giant tanks. Now what we have here is in this we have 3. G's. So what you have to remember is that first G is referring to glucose, second G is referring to glucose, which is gum and giant is referring to the third series third one which is galactose. So that means now the name is all is for allose, alterist is for altrose, gladly refers to glucose, make means M menos gum g gulose in i i dose giant g galactose and tanks t telos. So this is how you are going to memorize this table that is the table of L doses. Now we come to the question as to how will we make this family tree how will we correlate the structures of this family tree. 
then what you have to remember is that glycerol dehyde is the simplest monosaccharide, that is simplest LL dose, which is having three carbons. So, what we say that on paper, the family tree of L doses can be generated by beginning with D glycerol dehyde. So, when I say of D glycerol dehyde, so what you have to do is you just have to memorize the structure of G glycerol dehyde and I will show you by just memorizing the structure of G glycerol dehyde, how can we make other structures. Now, after we have drawn the structure of G glycerol dehyde, so now we have to go on to a tetros. So, what we will do? We will add tetros on top that is between the alcoholic group and the aldehyde group that is we will create a new bridge there and then to this bridge we will add a water molecule. So, when we do this, now we can add, when we add a water to this bridge, we can do it in two ways, which I will be just showing you shortly and then we will get two tetroses. Now, when we have two tetroses and these two, 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 these two tetroses, again when we will made, add another carbon, this will give us four L-dopentoses. Now, we have to add a sixth carbon, which will result in eight L-dohexoses. So, now let us make it simple. So, what you as I have already told you, please concentrate here, that is you have to remember the structure of glycerol dehyde, which is having three carbons in it, that is CHO, CHOH and CH2OH. And now you also know that we are calling this, we are giving this structure deconfiguration, because this OH is on the right hand side. So, now when I have to make a tetros, we that means we are doing the lengthening of the chain, which we normally do by kliani fischer synthesis, which we will be again discussing in the next lecture. So, now we have to insert a carbon here. So, this carbon I have shown with a red color here, we have inserted this carbon. Now, to this carbon, when we insert this carbon, we have two possibilities. We have made a bridge here. Now, to this bridge, we have to add a water molecule. Water molecule how? To the one side of the carbon bridge, we will add hydrogen and to the other side, we will add OH. Now, the question comes to which side will you add H and to which side will you add OH? This is very simple to remember. Please see the direction of the arrow. The, direc the direction in which this arrow is pointing we will add H on that side. That means, in this side, in this here, the arrow is pointing on the left hand side. Since the arrow is pointing on the left hand side, that means hydrogen will be added on the left. Whereas, if I look into the other structure, here H is the arrow is pointing on the right hand side, hence H will be added on the right hand side. So, we have now two tetroses, one is the erythros, other is the threos. So, and the other thing that you have to keep in mind is the erythros and the threos nomenclature which we had done in my previous lecture. Please recapitulate that erythros is that structure in which the two identical groups are on the same side, whereas threos is the structure in which the two identical groups here that is OH and OH are on the opposite side. So, now if I talk of erythros, we will do the same thing with the erythros. That is we can again, we will again create a bridge between this carbon here now and the CHO here. So, we are getting pentoses and then when we look into these pentoses, what we find is that since this arrow is pointing on the left hand side, H will go on the left hand and in this structure, H will go on the right hand side. So, in erythros, when the H goes on the left hand side, we get D ribose and when this H goes on the right hand side, D arabinose is formed. Similarly, from D threos, there are two possibilities that is we can get D xylose, D xylose we get when we add H on the left hand side of the carbon bridge, the new carbon bridge that we have created 
and we will get d lyox when we add h on the right hand side of the bridge. Now, similarly now since we have how many pentoses do we have here 4 pentoses. Now, what you have to remember is that each of these pentose that is d ribose will give us 2 hexoses, d arabinose will again give us a pair of hexoses. If we talk of d xylose again we will get 2 and if we get d lyox then again we are getting 2 aldose, aldohexoses here. So, now if we talk of, so if we look again as I have said that the direction of the arrow will represent the side on which the hydrogen will be added. So, we get LOs, next is LTROs, after that if I talk of D arabinose, from D arabinose again we are getting two stereoisomers, one is D glucose which structure is very important which we will have to memorize and then we have D menos. And similarly, if I talk of D xylose from D xylose we are getting D gulose and D iodose. And in D gulose we what you have to remember is when we are making D gulose from D xylose that in this case the H will be added on the left side of the bridge whereas in D iodose the H will be added on the right hand side of the group. Bridge. Similarly, the D lysol, lysox will give us two structures the D galactose and D telos. So, what you have to remember now is that we just have to remember the structure of glyceraldehyde, create a bridge between CHO and CHOH, and then we will be making two stereoisomers from it by adding water to the bridge. And what you have to remember is in one the H will be going on to the left hand side and the in the other the H will be added on the right hand side. So, now if we have to remember the structures, so what we find is if it, I talk of erythros. So, if we talk of erythros and we look into D ribose, it is very simple to remember the structure of D ribose that in D ribose all the OH are on the same side. And from D ribose, if you look into the structure of LOs, what you find in structure of LOs, LOs means if I look into all, that means again here all the OH groups are on the same side of the chiral carbon. Whereas, if you look into the LTROs, then in LTROs, what we find is that LTROs is a epimer of D LOs, that is C2 epimer. And the OH is on the right hand side. Now, another imp very important monosaccharide that we have to remember is glucose. So, in this glucose what you have to remember is that in glucose the this uh, we will have to memorize the structure if you ca can make it fine, if you cannot make it you will have to memorize the structure and once we memorize the structure of glucose <coughs> then what we find is D glucose and D menos, these are epimers. So, now if we know that we are able to memorize the structure of D glucose, we shall be able to draw the structure of D menos, this I will be discussing shortly. And then again, what we know is D galactose is again an epimer of glucose. So, this is how you will remember the structures, and this is how you can also make the structures of aldoses. So, what you have to remember is that we have to lengthen the carbon chain starting with deglyceraldehyde and at every level a water molecule is added above the top bridge that is between CHOH and CHO and then the direction of the arrow will represent the side on which the hydrogen atom will be added on the next bridge. And basically, we will keep on repeating this process till we get to the bottom of the tree or to the bottom of the pyramid. So, what you have to remember is the top that is triose, tetraose, and pentoses you are going to remember by get rexil, and the hexoses we are going to remember by remembering the sentence all alterists gladly make 
gum in giant tanks. Now, if we talk of configuration of ketosis, then what we know that the ketonic group is on the second carbon and that means if it is on the second carbon, we will have one carbon less as compared to L doses and since the one carbon is less, the number of stereoisomers of ketosis will be half as compared to L doses with same number of carbon atoms. And then what you have to remember is that in L doses, if L doses have three L dopentoses have three chiral carbon atoms, then in that case the number of stereoisomers would be 8. Whereas when we talk of ketopentoses, then in that case the number of chiral carbons are 2, that is one chiral carbon is less. So, what you have to remember here is that the number of stereoisomers would be half, that means they will be 4 here. That means for L-dopentosis, the number of stereoisomers are going to be 8, whereas if we talk of ketopentosis, the number of stereoisomers are going to be 4. Now, if I talk of the configuration of ketosis, we, we shall be following the same pattern. But in this case, what you remember is that we will be creating a bridge between the CH2OH and CO here because we know that dihydroxyacetone is the simplest ketose. So, we will now generate a bridge here and what you have to remember is that when we are generating a bridge here, this is the first chiral carbon here. In dihydroxyacetone, we do not have a chiral carbon. So, when we have created a chiral carbon here, so here we are talking of the D configuration. So, I have taken the D isomer here in which the OH is on the right hand side. Now, we know that this D erythrose, erythro erythrolose can have two stereoisomers. How? Now, you will again create a bridge between CH CHOH and CO and when we create this bridge you have to remember that this side the left side the arrow is pointing. So, in this case the hydrogen will be added on the left hand side resulting in the formation of D rebulose and whereas if the H is added on the right hand side we are getting D xylulose. Now, we can go on further from D rebulose we will go on to the next series which is having 6 carbons in it. So, again this will have on the left hand side and the right, left and right hand side resulting in the formation of D piscos and D fructose and similarly D xylos will give us D sorbos and D tegetos. So, this is how you are going to make the different structures of L doses and hexoses without memorizing the structures. You will only memorize the structure of glyceraldehyde for L doses and dihydroxyacetone for ketosis. So, I have already shown, I have already clarified the difference between erythro and the 3O epimers and so what we have, I will just quickly go through this again that if I talk of D erythros and L erythros, these are enantiomers. That is they are optically active isomers which are non superimposable mirror images of each other. Whereas, if I compare D erythros with D triose or D erythros with L triose, please remember these are epimers that is they are not mirror images of each other and they differ at configuration only at one carbon. That is in this case the configuration at the second carbon OH is on the right hand side whereas in D3OS this OH is on the left hand side. Now, if I talk of the another structure glucose and mannose I would like to concentrate here for a moment that if we are having C2 epimers generally we do not refer to C2 epimers we just call them epimers. And now this, this C2, C3, C4 refers to the carbon at which the configuration is different. So, I told you when I was talking of the chart for the pyramid for the L doses that you have for glucose you remember the structure, you can memorize this structure and how will you memorize this structure? There is an easy way of memorizing the structure. 
you have I think heard army people parading. How do they parade? Left, right, left and then right. It is not left, right, left, right. It is left, right, left. So, what we do here is left. Sorry, here we go on to right, left, right, right. So, this is the structure of glucose. So, now when we talk of the structure of glucose, so now what we know is that the configuration is different at C2. So, mannose is the epimer of glucose. So, now if we remember the structure of glucose, I am correcting myself here that is this would be right, left, right, right. This is how you are going to memorize the position of the OH. And then for mannose, the, all the positions will be same except at the second carbon. And then we know that if we talk of fructose and tagatose, they are also epimers. Now, how do these one epimer converts into other? This I shall be dealing in the second half of the lecture. Thank you. With this note, thank you ma'am. Thank you so much for giving us this uh, session. Friends, you are requested to be with us as we are back after a short break and we promise to give you more of the knowledge on the following topic. So, keep watching us. Thank you. Hello friends, welcome back to this session. Friends, in this session we are going to talk on epimerization and absolute configuration of monosaccharides. And for the discussion of the topic, we have with us in our studios Dr. Prajita Chauhan. Dr. Prajita Chauhan is Associate Professor in Department of Chemistry and she is teaching in Sri Aurobindo College, University of Delhi. She is an author of numerous books on chemistry and her books are widely reached as well as accessible to 
the students and admired too. Friends, if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Prajita Chauhan on today's topic, then do call us through our toll-free number. Our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. Now, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Prajita Chauhan, once again. Hello, ma'am. Welcome. Thank to the you. Lecture. Thank you, Gitika. So, in the first half, we've taken the configuration, that is, structures of aldohexoses and aldoketoses and what we find that what is the relationship between these structures that is if I talk of D glucose and L glucose then they are enantiomers that is they are non superimposable mirror images of each other whereas if we look into the structure of glucose and mannose or glucose and galactose then they are epimers that is they differ in configuration at in for glucose and mannose are C2 epimers that is they differ in configuration at second carbon whereas if I talk of glucose and galactose then they are C4 epimers. Now how does this epimerization take place or how does one epimer convert into the other epimer. So, what we find is that if we take a solution of alkaline solution of glucose, then aldosin and ketosis that it is not only uh, glucose which undergoes epimerization, we have seen even ketosis like fructose also has a epimer which is tegatose. So, these ketose, uh, ket the aldoketose that is fructose can also epimerize that is can change into its uh, epimer. So, how do normally these reactions take place that an alkaline medium they undergo epimerization and rearrangement reactions to form variety of products. So, and not only this what we find is that if I talk of D glucose in alkaline medium D glucose will epimerize to give us mannose and at the same time this glucose can undergo any Doyle rearrangement to form fructose. So, after some time what we find is that in the reaction medium we have D glucose, D mannose and D fructose in equilibrium. So, how does this reaction take place? So, what happens here is that in alkaline medium base removes a proton from alpha carbon from here. When it removes a proton from alpha carbon this bond goes or as a negative charge on this carbon or this bond if we talk of the resonating structure here this results in the formation of a double bond between these two carbons and the negative charge goes on the oxygen resulting in the formation of the enolate ion. So, in the first step what is happening is we are getting enolate ion and what you have to remember is that now this carbon is no more asymmetric that is it is no more chiral and since this carbon is sp2 hybridized what we find is that now the sp2 hybridized carbon will have its structure it will have a planar structure now what happens in the next step is that this will react with the solvent molecule again and deprotonation will take place and when the deprotonation takes place since this carbon is sp2 hybridized now the H can add from the either face of this carbon. This I have shown in the next slide, but basically what does epimerization involve? Epimerization changes the configuration of a carbon by removing a proton and then reprotonating it. So, what I mean here is that in the first step base will remove this proton that is it is undergoing deprotonation resulting in the formation of an enolate ion. And as we have seen that in this enolate ion, this carbon is sp2 hybridized, it has a planar structure. So, now when the pro deprotonation takes place, this proton can change, can add from the either of the surfaces that is it can add from this side or from this side. If it adds from the same side, it will result in the formation of glucose. But if it adds from the opposite phase, it will result in the formation of mannose. So, what has happened here? One 
form that is one epim glucose has changed into its epimer which is mannose. So, now please we can cons again recapitulate here that epimers differ in configuration at only one carbon. So, only at the second carbon here the OH is in glucose the OH is on the right hand side whereas, in the mannose this OH is on the left hand side and at the rest of the carbons the configuration is same that is at the third carbon OH is on the left in glucose as well as it is left in mannose and then what we find is that the two OH on the other side are on the right hand side and then they are also on the right hand side. So, now next we go on to is the enidiol rearrangement. So, when we talk of an enidiol rearrangement, glucose also undergoes enidiol rearrangement to form defructose. That is now a aldohexose is being converted into ketohexose and we know that enidiols are highly reactive sugars and this interconversion reaction is known as Lobry D. Brun van Ekenstein transformation after the founders of th this reactions. So, now what we find in this reaction is that the base the first step is the same as in epimerization that is base removes a proton from here resulting in the formation of the enolate ion. Now, what happens is now when we talk of the enolate ion that is we have a double bond here and a negative charge on oxygen. This oxygen being highly reactive acts as a base and picks up a proton from the solvent which is water resulting in a formation of one OH group. So, what we find is now in this we have a ene that is double bond between two carbons here and then we have two alcoholic groups here hence this intermediate is known as ene diol ene for the double bond di for the two alcoholic groups. Now, in these two ene diol we have alcoholic groups at number carbon number 1 and carbon number 2. So, now what we find here is that is if I talk of carbon number 1 and we are able to remove the proton here from this carbon then what we will find is we will get mannose. Whereas, if it undergoes that is if it undergoes toshomerism at C1 we will get mannose and glucose and if this undergoes toshomerism at carbon number 2 then we will get fructose. Let us see how this happens. So, what we find is if we look into the structure of ene diol I am showing you the formation of fructose here. So, what happens here is that the base OH minus picks up a proton from here resulting again in the formation of the enolate ion. And now, if by chance this base had picked up a proton from C 1 carbon we would have got a enolate at this position. Now, what happens is that since this we are getting this enolate ion. So, what happens in the next step if we go back into the structure. So, what we will find is that this double bond is come being formed between carbon and oxygen as a result of this this double bond here this bond here picks up a proton from the water molecule. So, what happens here is that this how does this pick up a proton from water molecule this is coming here as a double bond as a result of this this pi bonds go and result as in the formation of a negative charge on this carbon. Now, this carbon picks up a proton from water molecule resulting in this structure. So, what we find is that when this structure the reaction takes place at C 2 carbon then we get D fructose that is the reprotonation in this case will take place at the C carbon resulting in formation of fructose. So, that is how one epimer converts into the other epimer that is glucose changes into mannose and glucose by ene diol rearrangement converts into fructose. 
Similarly, now fructose if it dissolve take fructose in an alkaline medium, fructose can also undergo epimerization and in diol rearrangement in a similar way. So, now let us talk of the limitations of the DL configuration. So, when I talk of the configuration before starting with absolute configuration, I would like to talk of the limitations of DL configuration. So, we see that DL configuration can be applied only when the main chain and the main substituents can be chosen without doubt that is in case of monosaccharides. If I talk of this example, then the there is ambiguity as to which chain I am going to take as the parent chain because it just, it just has one carbon in it and this compound is I bromo chloro idomethane. So, to which group are we going to which chain is going to be a parent chain. Since we cannot decide which is a parent chain, we cannot give it the D or the L configuration and we say that D L configuration specifies the configuration at only one chiral carbon and the configurations of the other chiral carbons have to be memorized which is a very difficult task. And then if you remember when we were talking of the D L nomenclature, we said the position of the O H on the highest numbered asymmetric carbon. So, if I talk of the highest numbered asymmetric carbon with reference to glycerol dehyde, so glucose has configuration capital D. But we do not know what is the configuration at these three chiral carbons. So, this is so we are only referring to the configuration at the highest chiral carbon. So, now we come to absolute configuration, and this absolute configuration was given by Khan, Ingold, and Prelog, which are also known which are also known as CS, CIS rules. CIP rules and according to these rules what we can do is we can assign very correctly the configuration at the each chiral carbon without any ambiguity. So, we can clearly specify whether the what is the configuration at the each chiral carbon whether it is a it is a monos it is a carbohydrate it is a pro amino acid it is any other chiral molecule and then we assign the configuration at the each chiral carbon by designating it as R configuration or as S configuration. So, but before we can assign the R and the S uh, uh, configuration, we have to follow certain sequence rules and these sequence rules are done to assign priorities to the substituents. So, let us see how will we assign priorities to the substituents. So, in case what we have to remember is the rule number R, rule number 1 says that in case all the substituents which are attached to the chiral carbon are different, then we will give them priority on the basis of atomic number that is the group or the atom which is having highest atomic number will have priority number 1 followed by group which is having next atomic number that will be given atom priority number 2 and third will be the one which has the little less priority. So, now in this case what I am trying to indicate is between iodine, chlorine and bromo iodo. Iodine has the highest atomic number we have given it priority number 1 followed by bromine which has the next uh, atomic number then chlorine and followed by hydrogen which is having lowest priority number. So, group which has the highest priority is given number 1 followed by 2, 3 and 4. Now, the next point is if we have 2 atoms of the 2 atoms that is isotopes are attached to the chiral, car chiral carbon that is I have isotopes of hydrogen here that is proton and deuterium. So, in this case now the atomic number is going to be the same you know isotopes are atoms which have the same atomic number, but different mass number. So, in this case we cannot give priority on the basis of atomic number. So, what we do is here we give priority on the basis of mass number or atomic mass. When we do that 
we will consider atomic masses of all the atoms that is atomic mass of carbon, atomic mass of bromine, hydrogen and deuterium. We know atomic mass of bromine is highest, so it is given priority number 1 followed by carbon which is given priority number 2 followed by deuterium which is given priority number 3 and then proton which is given atom number 4. So, after, so that means if there are atoms of different elements we will give them priority on the basis of atomic numbers. If they are atoms of the same isotope then if, what we will do is we will give them the priority on the basis of the atomic masses. Now, the rule number 2 say, says that if we are not able to decide priority on the basis of first carbon. So, what I like to simplify it that when we are giving priority to the groups, we give them priority on the basis of atom to atom and wherever we get the first point of difference that is where we stop. Please remember we are stopping at the first point of difference and we will not add the atomic numbers because that will give us altogether a different picture. So, now if I have to decide the priority between which has higher priority a methyl group when it is attached to a chiral carbon or an ethyl group when it is attached to a chiral carbon. So, now let us see how we will do this example. If I talk of carbon, carbon has atomic number 6 and here also carbon has atomic number 6. So, here we cannot decide on the basis of the carbon. Let us go to next atom which is hydrogen in both the cases. So, in both the cases the priority the atomic number would be 1, we cannot decide it. Let us go to the next again hydrogen here and hydrogen here. Again the atomic number is same, still we cannot find out the difference. So, now let us go to third carbon. If I talk of here in ethyl, this is carbon whose atomic number is 6. Whereas, if I talk of methyl, its atomic number sorry of hydrogen, its atomic number is 1. So, we will give higher priority to ethyl over the methyl, right. So, this is when the we have the same groups, we cannot decide the priority on the basis of the first carbon that is if the two of the atoms attached to the chiral center are same and the priority sequence cannot be decided on the basis of rule number 1, then the relative priorities can be deciding, decided by comparing the second or even the third or the fourth atom of the respective group. So, now the rule number 3 says that if the our substituent is branched or a, the group has multiple substituents. So, what we do is we must group move around the group. Here I have taken again example of two groups. Now, what here I have taken is this you know is the ethyl whereas, if we look into this group this is isopropyl group. Now, if we compare these two groups then what we find here is that this carbon and this carbon is having the same priority that is 6 and 6, hydrogen is having the same hydrogen and hydrogen. Now, if I compare methyl with hydrogen, now you are not here comparing methyl with hydrogen, we will compare carbon with hydrogen. So, we say carbon has higher priority as compared to hydrogen. So, this group will have higher priority that is isopropyl will get higher priority that is if these are the two groups, I will give priority number 1 to isopropyl and priority number 2 to the ethyl group. Now, let us take up an example of bromoethyl and isopropyl. Now, in this case if we look into it, the carbon is having the same atomic number, so priority is the same. Hydrogen again is having the same atomic number, we cannot decide on the basis of hydrogen. But if I talk, compare carbon with bromine, then what we find is the atomic number of bromine is higher than carbon. That means, this group that is bromoethyl group will get higher priority as compared to isopropyl group. So, we will give priority number 1 to this and priority number 2 to this. Now, for example, just let me compare these three groups we have in a molecule. So, what are you going to remember? 
we are giving priority number 1 to bromoethyl, priority number 2 to isopropyl and priority number 3 to methyl group. And supposing the hydrogen was the fourth group, we would get priority number 4 to the hydrogen which is the lowest priority. So, what you have to remember is that when we are giving priority 1, 1 mean indicates that that group is having the highest priority and 4 indicates that that particular group is having the lowest priority. Now, the fourth rule says that if the second atom is attached by a double or a triple bond, then how do we treat these double bonds? So, what I am trying to tell you here is that this carbon is attached to this carbon by a double bond. So, when we treat this double bond, we will treat it as two single bonds. So, that means this carbon is attached to this carbon and this carbon is now attached to another carbon because it is that that means you will break the double bond into two halves and this will be added to another carbon here and similarly this will be added we will have another carbon here. So, this group will be now treated as C attached to an H attached to an R or let me look at this from here this is attached to a chiral carbon here. So, that means this group is attached to a hydrogen here then it is attached to a carbon here, it is attached to another carbon here and then to another carbon here. Let us look into a molecule, a group which is having a triple bond. We will treat this triple bond as three single bonds, right. So, when we treat this as three single bonds, it will become one single here, single here, second single and this is the third single. Similarly, for this carbon, first single, second single and then we have the third single bond. So, that means now which group is having priority? If in a molecule, we have a group which is having a triple bond as well as a double bond, please remember you will give higher priority to a group which is having a triple bond because for triple bond, we will consider carbon attached to a carbon here. Whereas, in this case, this carbon is attached to a hydrogen. So, this carbon has higher atomic number as compared to hydrogen. So, this is having higher priority. Now, after we have decided the priorities on the basis of first case, you have to remember is if the atoms are different on the basis of atomic number, if they are isotopes, then on the basis of atomic masses, if the, the group is branched then we will go from atom to atom till we reach a point where we are getting difference in atomic numbers and if in a molecule we have a double or a triple bond, then double bond will be treated as two single bonds and a triple bond will be treated as a three triple single bonds. Now, after we have decided the priority of the four groups or atoms attached to the chiral carbon, the molecule or the compound is now rotated so that the group which is having lowest priority is away from the observer, right. That means that we can we have to rotate the molecule so that the group which is having lowest priority is far away from it so that our eye follows at last on it. And then we will look at the arrangement of the remaining groups and then if we say that our eye we will have to see is going from group having highest priority to lowest priority in a clockwise direction or in a anti clockwise direction. So, what you have to remember is you will keep the group having lowest priority away from you and then you will view the molecule in such a way that your eye travels from the group having highest priority to the group having lowest priority that is from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. So, and if your eye travels in clockwise direction, let me show here that is this is having group number 1. What we have done here is we have taken this group which is having lowest priority away from us and now when we are traveling our eye travels from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 in clockwise direction, we will give this configuration R. And R is derived from the Latin word meaning rectus, which is right. And if your eye travels in 
anti-clockwise direction from group having highest priority to the lowest priority, then we will give it configuration S which means sinister which is a Latin word meaning left. So, now let us look into few examples. Now, supposing you are given a Fisher projection formula and you have to rotate the Fisher projection formula. So, what you have to remember is that we are allowed to rotate the formula by 180 degrees within the plane of the paper which will give us equivalent structures or which will give us identical structures. What I mean by saying here is I will illustrate it with an example that is now if I look into this molecule and I have to rotate it. So, we will rotate it by 180. Now, what I mean by saying I will rotate it by 180 that is CH2OH will take the place of CHO and CHO will take the place of CH2OH that is we will interchange these two groups and similarly we will interchange these two groups. If we do that we will come back to the original configuration. Now, I will just demonstrate it what I mean here is supposing I have this this is one angle and if I rotate it by 90 degrees that means this is my horizontal I am rotating it by 90 that means I am going on to vertical. So, this position is opposite to the horizontal position that means if this is having R configuration this will have S configuration. So, now to go back to the original molecule I will rotate it by another 90 so that I have done this. So, that means you have to make an interchange of 180 that means if I am talking of this a vertical group a group which is on the vertical line should stay on the vertical line and the group which is on the horizontal line should stay on the horizontal line that is group which is going away from the observer here I have shown in a three dimensional formula should go away from the observer and the, these groups which are coming towards the um, observer that is they look like they are embracing the observer they should be on the horizontal lines. So, I have made two interchanges here. So, this is an R configuration which is again giving me R configuration and if I talk of the S it will give us the S configuration. What I meant is when I said that we will never make a odd interchange that is you will never make an interchange of 90 degrees because if you make an interchange of 90 degrees as, as I have already demonstrated we will get a enantiomer. So, see what I have done here is I have made an enantiomer here so, I have made an interchange here. So, this I have demonstrated with this example this is what the gentleman is doing here he has raised it by 90 degrees. So, what is he having he is having an opposite configuration. So, what have we result we have resulted that is R is going into S and this interchange is not allowed we will not get the same molecule to get the same molecule we should bring this arm back that is we should make another interchange of 90 that is total interchange should be of 180 degrees then only we will get the original configuration. So, now in the next lecture I shall be taking up how do we assign R and S configurations to the chiral centers in the Fisher projection formulas. Thank you. Thank you ma'am. Thank you so much for giving precious inputs to this uh, very session. Friends, we know that you might have lots of questions in mind as well as you wish to give your feedback. Then do write to us at info.cec at nic.in. We will love to solve your queries when next time Dr. Prajita Chauhan visits our studio. So keep watching us, keep writing us. We are going to meet soon. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much.